Hello, everybody on the stream. We are back for another round of interesting topics. Um, Aditya, anything else about the previous talk that came to your mind during the break? Uh, I just reflected on uh, what they do for startups and how they empower them with uh, credits or packages for internet services. And yep. that's a really good thing. And I look forward to more startups using Liquid Telecom as a provider. That's indeed, um, indeed, you. indeed. That's indeed a very good suggestion about the credits is in, in regards to cloud computing because um, I know Microsoft is giving you like two hundred dollars for the first um, 30, 30 days. Uh, I just had the situation with Google Cloud; they give you three hundred dollars for valid for twelve months. And actually, I'm curious about the situation with Amazon because <laughs> AWS. I think you can also apply for some extra credit, but maybe we in invite our next speaker, uh, which is uh, Kobus Bernhard. He is an AWS Senior Developer Advocate for the Sub-Saharan Africa region. Kobus, welcome on board. And do you have any feedback on the credits by Amazon AWS? Uh, yes, so uh, we actually have a couple of mechanisms. It's not a simple, here's just, you know, a dollar value for you to go play with. Um, so we've got something called the free tier. Uh, so each of the services has got a specific um, portion of free tier and it differs. Um, some, for example, Amazon EC2, which is virtual machines, allow you to run a, a T2 micro or T3 micro, either Linux or Windows, for 750 hours per month for free for the first 12 months. So you've got a 12-month window uh, to run one server to play around with uh, for free. Um, other services okay. have a permanent free tier. So, for example, if you look at DynamoDB, um, the first five gigs that you install with it um, is free with uh, certain um, configurations. So you've got those two options. So all of the services have got a lot of different um, uh, free tier options available to them that you can take a look at. Um, and then also on the credits portion, we've actually got a program for startups called um, AWS Activate where okay. um, when the startup uh, qualifies for that, they can get um, anything between 1000 and and $100,000 in AWS credits over two years, um, depending on what the needs and things are. So if you are in that scenario, definitely reach out to uh, your account manager or reach out to AWS. Um, we've got various, and that's just two of the ways. Um, there are other programs as well. So there are a couple of ways you can actually do that. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really great. All right, couples, thank you. Coming back, your second turn uh, during the virtual developers conference, <laughs> and after the fantastic session on Wednesday, what are you going to talk about now in your in your one hour slot? Well, we're going to be talking about how things break and how to build things to not break, um, because that's quite important when you start building large um, distributed systems. So. This talk is going to be on resiliency and availability design patterns for the cloud, um, specifically focusing on uh, um, how to do some uh, API calls, timeouts for databases, scale your database, etc. Awesome. All right. Looking forward to it. Please, Kobus, yeah. the stage is yours. Cool. Awesome. Um, so like mentioned, my name is Chris Bernard. Um, I'm not going to be doing my intro slide again. We can look at that from the previous video. Um, and this deck uh, has got a little bit more history than some of the other decks that I've done. So firstly, thank you to Adrian, who's um, uh, on our team. He's the principal um, or a principal uh, developer um, advocate. Um, and he focuses on architecture and specifically chaos engineering. So literally the how you break things and make sure that they survive that breaking. So this is one of his decks, and I actually use this one because it's such a fun, awesome desk, deck to present, and there's so many fun bits in here that I want to share. But definitely give him a follow if you are interested in chaos engineering uh, or want to learn more about it. He focuses on this, and he actually has got quite a lot of uh, GitHub repos with some sample code, etc., to do that. But let's start off with understanding why systems that break are important to understand how they break. Um, so when we start looking here is this is a short video clip with a system running, which is, you know, the roadway with the cards, and there is our user. And uh, our user is about to uh, make something or do something that we didn't quite expect. Um, and this is a typical thing for users. They love to, you know, use the system in a specific way. And what you can see over here is you can see the trouble coming and whoopsie, uh, not only is the user exp experiencing an issue, the entire system is down because guess what? Those um, uh, dividers are now blocking the traffic for everybody else. So the main message here from that video is that you need to understand that distributed systems are hard. 
where when you build a system in isolation, that isolated part might actually work well. But as soon as you start building up this more complex set of uh, services together, you're going to have uh, things that start failing. And what we want to do is we need to build systems and understand that they can and will fail unpredictably. Just kidding, in unpredictable ways. Um, so I just want to share this. Um, it's... <laughs> yes, I did have to warn the organizers about this because um, Gunnar Grosh is also into um, chaos engineering and he actually used this, um, but with a, a projector going into default mode like no signal. And an organizer ran up to unplug his laptop. So we did organize and warn people beforehand. So yes, but point being is, you have these kind of failures happening all the time. And as the CTO of Amazon.com says, failures are given and everything will eventually fail over time. So now that we know that things are going to fail the whole time, how do we go about you know, building for that and making sure that they, our systems at least fail as they are? Well, to do that, we need to start looking at what is resiliency and what do we mean by that? And it, one definition for it is the ability for a system to handle and eventually recover from unexpected conditions. Once again, this sounds... Thing, but let me show you practically what this means with once again a video. Now this video is going to start off with the system in a degraded mode or partial failure mode. And what you can see here is that the one wheel is broken, but the system is still running. It might not be running optimally, it might, be, might not as fast as it normally does, but it's still going. And while this is going, we figure out how to fix the system and patch it while it's running. And, and then at the end, once we've uh, applied the patch and the fix, the system can go back to full capacity, but it never stopped working. It kept going. And that's what you want your systems to do. You want them to be degraded, not down. And that's the focus of today's talk with a couple of tips and tricks on how to focus on that. So the question once again um, becomes, why do we build these resilient systems? Because on the one hand, it's nice to say, well, we want to keep the systems up. But on the other hand, there might be some bigger reasons you want to keep your systems up. And these are some numbers from reports. Um, and the one that I want to highlight is the second column quickly. If you look there, reading the white part of the text, which says the cost per hour of a critical application fla a failure, half a million to a million dollars per hour. Now, granted, not all systems run at this scale in terms of cost, but now we can start thinking about, you know, we want our systems to stay up. We can't afford systems to go down. For example, think stock trading systems. Imagine those systems go down or have mistakes. That's a lot of money. So let's get back to the question. How do we build resilient software systems? Well, often people think we just, you know, work on the code a little bit better, spin up two copies and we're done. It's like, no, no, no. You, you need to think about this more. It's not just about the code. So let's quickly take a look at what the base building blocks and things are that you have to take into account when you want to build resilient systems. First part is understanding the underlying infrastructure. Where is my code running? What does that look like? Is it one building? Is it two buildings, three buildings, et cetera? Then one layer up from that is, what does the network topology look like and how is my data moving through this network and where is my data stored? Because when you think about your uh, network, uh, when, as soon as you go past one physical box, you have the chance of having a network partition. So what happens when the network partitions? Because remember, everything fails and it fails eventually. What happens when that happens? Then now that you understand this, you build this into your application to, to have your application understand how to handle this infrastructure as well as how the network behaves and all of that. And then the last one, which people often forget about, is that you have to spend time with on the people to be able to um, practice and train and build things for uh, to be resilient. You don't just randomly say, okay, cool, well, my app is there. Let's everybody go for the weekend and hope it stays up over the weekend. And we combine all of that, that actually gives you your effectively your uh, recipe for a resilient system. So let's start digging into the details. Well, let's first talk about availability. Now, when you look at the definition for availability, um, you might have seen the middle definition, which is the uh, normal operation time, so the time that the system was up um, over the total time that it was running. So that gives you uh, a way to think about the total uptime. But a better way to think about that is to start looking at the MTBF or the mean time before failure. Because once again, remember, everything fails. What's the mean time before something will fail? You will often have seen this on uh, hard drives, the, the spinning ones, which say, listen, after the mean time before failure is 5 million hours. Uh, so given the uh, a typical hard drive, you have 5 million hours roughly until it fails. It can be a bit more, can be a bit less. But then what you want to measure is that you combine that with uh, MTTR, which is the mean time uh, to recovery or repair. And this is very, very important because there's a subtle difference here. It's not just how long is my system up for, but it's also how quickly can I recover? Because think of it this way. Let's say you've got a, um, something that goes wrong in production that takes the system down for a millisecond and it happens 50 times a day. Your users might not even notice that. 
because that recovery time is so short. Whereas, let's say it's something that takes down for 60 seconds, but only once a day. Your users will probably notice that hiccup, like click, 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 something's going on, it's not working. So once again, as with my previous talk, I'm going to give you some reading homework, which is please go read these two books. And for this talk, focus on the second one, which is Accelerate, because they do a lot of effort to uh, define the scientific methods behind the and the questions that they ask to figure out which companies perform better and why they perform better, and then also share the insight of what, what does that actually mean and how do you go about doing that. So once again, if you have one takeaway from this uh, talk, go buy those two books and read them. Um, I actually have given a, um, out a few copies of Phoenix Project people. So when I'm at conferences again one day, I'll probably have a copy to give to someone. So if you see, you might get lucky that day. So let's talk about how do you keep things available? Well, one way is by doing um, running systems in parallel. And don't worry, this is the only equation inside this uh, entire presentation. It's not a maths presentation. Um, but what this means is that when you put more components in parallel, you reduce the amount of time that they are statistically likely to be down at the same time. So let's quickly look at that in detail. So let's say um, you've got a, oh, sorry, the slide is a little bit mangled there. Um, but um, basically the first block there is that it's got two nines, which is 99%. So this means that if you've got one copy of it running, 99% of the time it's up and running, which means you have three days and 15 hours of downtime a year. So 99% sounds good. Three days does not sound good. So what this um, statistics tells us, if you run two of them in parallel, that immediately goes down to 49, so 99.99, um, and that's down to 52 minutes. The third one takes you down to 31 seconds. So this is no fancy magic. It's literally just instead of having one copy, you now have three copies running in parallel, and that's how you do it. So the lesson here is that component redundancy increases the availability significantly. And that's why when you look at, at the way that, for example, AWS builds our regions out, what we have is that we inside a region, we have got two or more availability zones. Um, Oh, the old ones, we, oh, we sometimes built with two, but by default, we build them with three or more now. And just quickly, terminology, an availability zone consists of one or more data center. And what we do is we build these data centers a significant distance apart from each other for the, data, for the availability zones. The reason is there might be a flood, there might be a power outage, et cetera, but they're still close enough to perform synchronous operations between the availability zones because they've got this uh, very highly connected mesh network to actually do that. So why is this important? Well, let's quickly look at what typical architecture looks like when you build in the cloud. So let's say you're building your new service inside a region. You can make use of these three different availability zones to host your application. Because remember, I said everything um, can break and breaks over time. So at some point, uh, there is a chance that an entire availability zone might go down. But if you build your application and architect it to run on three availability zones inside that region, you should be able to survive that. Um, and this is what we're going to be looking at a little bit about that. So often what we see people saying is that this is great. I just saw you show a nice, you know, worldview with regions all over the world. How about, you know, we just do global architecture first? Well, let's quickly take a look at the, what the benefits there are. So let's say you launch your app inside um, the east coast of the U.S. You build the app. It's a nice, little app. It does well. You start getting some users um, inside the U.S. They use your app. It does well. Then what happens is at some point someone starts talking about it and more people hear about it. Now you've got users inside Canada, you've got users inside South America. That's all fine because they're relatively close to the service, it's slow for them, but not too bad yet. Then an international news agency picks up your app and more people start learning about it. And all of a sudden, all over the world, you have people clicked into your app. That is great, except that's called physics. There is a speed limit to light. Yes, it's very fast, but there's still a speed limit and the earth is large. So there's a physical, how quickly can data go from East Coast US to, for example, Australia? And that can go up to 300 milliseconds or more, uh, depending on the exact distance. Because remember, it's not a straight line. The cable goes somewhere around there, then down around continents, those kind of things. So there's going to be latency. So how do we actually go ahead and improve the latency? Well, what often happens is that we say, okay, cool, we've got that app running in the US. Um, that's great for our US, Canadian, and South American customers. but let's deploy a second version in Europe. Because guess what? Take the code closer to your end users. They can actually access the app a lot quicker. Now, why am I talking about this? We're talking about resiliency. We're not talking about how to globally scale your application. That effect if you build your applications correctly. So now let's go back down just into the US version. We've got two copies running, East Coast and West Coast. And we've got four services in total running um, inside our application. Now what starts happening is that people are happily using the app. And all of a sudden, that one service on the West Coast stops having issues. Um, that one over there. 
And what this means is that because our app is now in a degraded state, it can't necessarily, uh, it, it can't actually process that part and it's a critical part of our systems. Well, if we designed it to be resilient, we could simply redirect traffic to not go to the US West, but start using the US East one. Now, this might not be optimal for those users. The app will feel a bit slower, um, especially let's say you take the example from the US versus Australia. The app is much slower, but the app is still up. And I can guarantee you a user might be annoyed that the app is slower, but they'll be a lot less happy with you if the app is completely done. So, sounds awesome. Sounds great, right? Op question is, well, let's go global. Should we do it first? Uh, should we go, you know, just build globally? Because you just showed me regions globally should be easy, right? No. First, figure out and perfect your regional architecture. Um, the reason for this is that you might have heard the term cascading failures. Because let's say you didn't have a good regional architecture, and now you've got spread across the world, seven copies of your app, and you can do this failover. So the first one fails because it can't handle the load. So you take all of that load, send it to the second one. Guess what? That one can't handle the load. Send that to the next one. So what happens is you've got this cascade failure. So always figure out how to handle failure inside the regional um, portion of your app first and design for that and figure out how to handle that. So let's talk a little bit more about that multi-availability zone architecture that I spoke about and how that makes your apps more resilient. So a typical um, web um, architecture that we see is that you've got an elastic load balancer with some um, web servers, uh, application servers that serves the requests, and they connect to some kind of database. So this instance, what we did is we built our service uh, to have got um, three instances, one in each of the availability zones, and we've got a database that has got a primary in the first zone and then a secondary in one of the other ones to standby. Then what happens is, boom, disaster strikes. Um, and disaster this is, can be as severe as the lightning strike. So my first AWS outage back in, I think, 2011, 2011, 2010 that I had to deal with was exactly this one availability zone for Ireland went completely dark, as in, boom, it's gone. Um, and the reason was lightning had struck a specific part of the building that took out everything. So even the backup power um, and certain things were taken out. So entire availability zone is gone. So what happens in this case? Well, because we built this with resiliency in mind, our load balancer figures out, hey, listen, the instance isn't healthy. I'm not going to send the traffic anymore. Then the next step that happens is that our database realizes that, hey, listen, the primary database is no longer talking. So now we um, switch over to the failover, and now that one becomes the new primary. So the takeaway here is that when you build multi vulnerability architecture, it immediately enables you to do fault-tolerant applications, because like I just showed you, it'll just bring it up. And also, the reason for that is that when that instance goes down, it'll come back up again, like I'll show you in a few seconds. And there are a couple of services you can use to do this easier. So the next part is auto-scaling. Now, we are all very familiar with diagrams that look like this. You know, we're selling the cloud to you. You can scale up and down depending on your need, you know, following it. That's great. Once again, the talk is about resiliency. How does this help us? Well, here's the interesting thing. Let's say you've got an application you want to keep up. Always run two copies of it because you can create self-healing applications this way. So we have got two copies of our app running. For some reason, the first app goes ahead and dies. And it's um, as bef uh, before the load balancer figures out not to send traffic to it. Then what we do is we bring up a new copy of it and the load balancer starts sending um, traffic to it. So run two copies and that, or more than one copy at least, that allows you to get easy self-healing without a lot of work. Because remember, we want to have resilient apps, but we don't have uh, six months to spend on doing it. So this is one easy way to actually get it um, to um, be more resilient. Then the next thing that is a good way to do that is by making use of the different responsibility models offered by the cloud to you. So what you can see over here is a whole bunch of AWS services. Don't worry, I'm not doing a sales pitch again. Um, but what I want to drive home is if you look to the left, you'll see that you can start off, for example, with on-prem virtual machines. Now, that's a lot of responsibility. You need to worry about the data center, power to the data center, connectivity to the data center, access to the data center, then internally um, cooling, et cetera. You need people. Is everybody there today? Is someone sick, et cetera? Then you have the physical machine. Who installs the operating system? Is it patched? Is it um, running? Um, all of those things. Then only do you get to the virtual machine layer. Then you have to worry, is the virtual machine up? Then you get inside the VM. Is your application running, et cetera? You take on a lot of responsibility. We look at um, some of the other cloud services available out there. If you look at something like Amazon Lambda, that allows you to run functions where the only thing that you are concerned about is the actual code that you write. And we as AWS take care of the rest. And you can see this in some um, in um, cloud providers as well. It's like the balance between where do I take on the responsibility? And that's where the cloud value comes in is like, 
don't worry about running servers because at the end of the day, if you think about running a server or example I usually use is you're going to buy a car. You buy, do you buy the car from vendor A instead of vendor B because vendor A was able to send those emails, you know, send them and receive them. They were really good at it. Those emails came in and they came out. It's like, no, that's table stakes. You need to be able to receive and send emails. Nobody cares if, you can, uh, if you've got a massive interesting infrastructure. Better example um, is, for example, Airbnb. You want to book a, a room with them to stay over somewhere or an entire house, but you don't care the infrastructure in the back end. You just want to use their service. So think about what it is that differentiates your um, service or application that you're building. Why spend time on all these other things? So don't take on those responsible models because remember, we've got teams of people that are specialists in those services to help it make it more resilient. So databases. Most people have some form of database at the um, bottom to actually store their data. And one of the most typical um, things that uh, databases deal with is, uh, for example, being able to scale, how do they deal with replication, and lastly, backups. So let's quickly dig into that. And Amazon.com actually had this issue way back um, uh, in 2008, nine. They'd reached the point where they could no longer scale vertically with the database systems that they had. So they went and did some research and actually wrote a white paper um, on what are the um, key value store that they want for um, uh, initial database? It was called Dynamo. It's not Amazon Dynamo. It was the precursor to it. And there's a, if you want to read it, very interesting information in there in terms of the design considerations. But what came out of that is that when you're building in a distributed database for the cloud and also at cloud scale, uh, it's slightly different. So things, for example, like being able to write an object um, from your application perspective. So I send a request saying, write this object, and I get an acknowledgement back. But in the background, the storage layer is actually intelligent enough to know the write to multiple different locations, including multiple availability zones. So single write, immediately it's replicated at least three times into different layers. Benefit with this as well, not only is the data now safer, is that when I access the data, uh, it's, there we go, sorry, bit of a lag, it's quicker, which means that I can access the data inside that one availability zone that I'm busy dealing with because there is a local copy for it. And if you look at some of the throughput stats, um, uh, and I know for Prime Day last year, the, the stats were actually quite impressive um, that came through. Uh, you can see that, yes, this database scales and it can actually hand, handle a lot of things. So getting back to the responsibility model, choose a database that you know can scale. And with that, you can see that there are a lot of different database types available. So part of this is not just picking um, the one that you think you know is going to scale the right way. Trust me, you can make something that's scalable, not scale in a whole lot of different ways, but pick the right database. Spend some time figuring out what is the problem you're trying to solve and then pick the database that is good for that problem. For example, graph databases, very good at finding relationships between different objects, for example, recommendation engines. You can't get in a relational database, but it's going to be a lot harder. So pick the right DB. That also, because you're not forcing it to operate in a way it's not supposed to, it makes your apps more resilient. So performance. How do we get our databases to perform better? The easiest one, which usually doesn't require too much application change, is separating your reads and your writes. So what you do is you've got your writes going to one primary database, and then you replicate that down into your read replicas. And the reason for this is that when you have this read-write separation, it means that you can run heavy real-time reports on that replicated data set without impacting your primary database as well. Um, because for those not familiar, when you do a select on a table, depending on the type of select you do, you normally, if it's small enough, it'll only lock up certain sections of the database if you're the most valid data. Because remember, there's always read-write contention. Because you have to answer this question, do I read the, the data right now or do I do what's known as a dirty read of the data that when I started my read was there, but in, in the meantime, something might have written to it. So you've got that contention. So split it out and say, listen, we know that there was a slight delay on the data, but we read off the read replicas. That gives you a lot of headroom. Then we get to a point where that doesn't uh, scale anymore. You need to scale your database some more. Start looking at database federation. And what you do here is similar to before, you've got your read and your writes split between the different um, nodes also split your databases. So one database handles your product database and the other one, for example, your users. Benefit for this is that you can scale, for example, your product database before you scale your user database if it's hit with heavier load. So that, al sorry. that allows you to scale where it's needed and not say I have to scale every single database at the same time. So it's useful to split those two. Then also the last uh, one to get even more out of um, your database, and this is specific to um, re uh, relational databases because some of the NoSQL, which stands for not only SQL, Databases do this for you by default if you define the partition key correctly, is to make use of database sharding. Now, what is a shard? A shard is where I take my data. For example, this is a terrible example, by the way, so I'm showing it. Don't shard on surnames because surnames are not distributed evenly across the alphabet, unfortunately. But let's say that was the key that you were that was evenly distributed. You would say 
A to F goes onto the first database, then G to uh, P goes into the second one, etc. So what happens then is that when I want to try to write a reader record, it means that I look at, do that calculation of which shard does it go to? Okay, send the request that way. Things to consider here, however, is that what do you do when your shards become uh, overloaded and you need to re-shard? So instead of doing thirds, we're now doing quarters because we're adding an extra shard. Because remember, during that time, you need to move data between the nodes. So think about how you want to handle that if you do get to that, because that's also part of a re resilient system is thinking about future upgrades and or in terms of load and how to upgrade and change the architecture. So now that we've got our data running and all of that, it is about time we start speaking a little bit about backups. Um, backups are important. Most people you know, would agree that you need to have backups. So usually here is where I take a pause and quickly ask the audience, please put up your hands if you've tested your backup in the last week and then take a slow, start giggling. Yes, testing backups is more important than actually doing backups. How did you? So you do backups? Fun question. When last did you test your backup? Well, it's about restoring it on a separate machine. Mm -hmm. So the, the 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 point here is normally when you ask people, have you tested your your backup? Because remember, if it's not if you haven't tested it, it's not a backup. It doesn't exist. So what you can see is. Um, this often happens where we just do something small. We just make some small change to the system. All of a sudden, everything is down. Um, and that's not a great feeling, especially if you figure out that your backup isn't working. And you can just go search for uh, backup failures, and you'll find lots of um, examples of where it failed for large companies. Things like, for example, uh, people um, not being able to restore the backup, or the backup file was actually empty, or there wasn't even a backup file. So that's terrible. You want to be this little guy where... You say, we have the backups and they work. So once again, the point here is, A, you want to test your backups and also um, make use of services that make backup easy for you. This is just one example. There are lots of different services that help you do your backups correctly and also help you test the backups. That's one way of securing your data. Another one is you can actually make use of built-in mechanisms in cloud providers to actually block accidental drops. So for example, in this case, it's an IAM policy that prevents you from dropping a database. Um, um, and if you try and drop it, what, uh, you'll get an error. And until you, sorry, permission denied, you may not drop this table. You can even do it on, on SQL. You can write triggers because remember, triggers actually all the uh, SQL query runs. So you can do things like create a trigger that throws an error if you want to try and drop a database. And you can see there at the bottom that it says cannot delete because that's the error message that we specified. So this is some easy ways that you can start building into your systems to make them more resilient because um, at some point, you're going to make a mistake. A uh, classic example, me, second day of my very first job, I thought I was going to get fired because I was tasked with building out a query to find people abusing a sign-up bonus that we had in the system. So I wrote this query, and I was proud of it. I mean, I was young. I knew everything, so I could solve any problem. So awesome query. So run the select version of it, and it brings the people, went to double-check the data, showed it to um, the senior engineer I was working with, and he's like, this looks good. Cool, now go run it on production. So first hint here is second day, First time developer, don't give them production access on day two. All right. Second lesson, lesson I learned that day is that, and then it just, it was very quick, which is a little bit odd because we had a half a million people in the database. It also said that half a million rows affected. And that's when I realized like something went wrong. So it's that moment of panic where you sit there going like, what happened? And what had happened is that I had this perfect query. Remember when I ran the select? So I had the applet version, update table, set, locked equal one, where? And I had selected only the first four rows. Update table, set, lock one, nothing else. I'd locked everybody out of the database. So mad scramble to actually do that. So there are ways you can actually protect your database um, against that one being don't give new devs access to production. But what you want to do is you definitely want to practice and test recovery from those backups because if they don't, if you haven't tested it, it doesn't work. So let's talk a little bit about timeouts, backoffs, and retries. And this is another thing where people don't always realize how easy it is to make the app a little bit more resilient. So let's take a typical application where you've got a user and they are making some requests to your application and your database starts getting um, a bit of load. So what actually happens when our database starts um, slowing down? Well, as we all know, we tend to have um, timeouts configured on different connections. So let's take a quick look at it. We've got some timeouts on the client side as well as on the backend side, but we don't bother thinking about what the values are. We just use the defaults because we didn't have to before. So let's quickly look at exactly what happens. Well, user goes ahead and does a call. That creates an insert on the database. Database gets under load because it's trying to insert, for example, into an undexed, yeah, unindexed table. What does the user do? 
because that uh, connection is slow. The, the timeout um, on the back end but is typically set to something like infinite. On the client side, it's set to 10 seconds. So um, that now creates some load on our database connection pool because guess what? That connection hangs from our application server to the database. From the user's perspective, it went away. So what does the user do? They start saying retry. Guess what that does? Creates another one. The database is still under load. It creates another one that starts hanging. And eventually what happens is the user keeps on clicking because this is what users do. They don't think, hmm, maybe the backend is slow. Let me back off a little bit and wait for it. It's like, no, no, click, 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 click. We want to go at it now. So what then happens is that, uh, let's say by the fourth one, all of a sudden what happens is when they now want to try is that we no longer have connections available in our connection pool because guess what? All of them are um, in use at the moment. So what's a better way to solve this? Well, well, when you look at, for example, languages, this is just an example of C Sharp, uh, the HTTP web request has got a config where you can set a timeout on it. So use it. Uh, similarly, there are multiple places you can set timers. You can set them um, on a lot of the um, services or uh, connections to databases. Let's say ORM or, um, for example, just the plain JDBC driver that you use to connect to your database, etc. You can also even set them inside the database itself. So there are multiple ways to set them with all of these things built into the language or system that you're using. And the last thing that you can do is you can, for example, also um, add some additional code to your um, application if it doesn't have that in or if you've got a different timeout and want to stagger the different timeouts. Um, so you can add them on the code level as well. So question here is how else can we prevent this error? Because remember what happened there is that the user click, 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 click and did that. Now, let's say your database did go down and couldn't handle the load and now it's back up again, but you had 50,000 users all sitting over there. Are we there yet? What will happen then as soon as your database comes up, poof, it hits it again. So that's not a great scenario. So let's quickly look at how do we fix this? And the answer there is that we are going to use um, exponential back off. What does that look like? Oh, this is, sorry, a little bit sad. My Windows doesn't seem to like my animations. Um, but what happens is that a user, when you click, is aware of this exponential backup. And what it does, is it says that I click retry, it immediately does a retry. But then when I click it again, it waits two seconds. Click it again, four seconds, eight seconds, 16 seconds. Because if the system hasn't responded yet, you know, we're going to wait um, and um, need to wait for it to get uh, to actually catch up. And what would happen in that scenario, which I had here with the lovely animation, is that those slow running inserts will start um, finishing and timing out and being resolved because they've got a timeout of 10 seconds. And then because you're only coming back in after 16 seconds, the database has had time to actually recover. Let's see, quickly see. Okay, so it's going to take them away. Cool. Sorry, this is, I normally present on Mac, this is Windows. Um, so what happens is when those connections start going away, um, wow, it only wants certain ones. Well, like I said, everything fails every time, and this one is not planned. So apologies for that. Um, it starts releasing the connections, and ultimately the request does go through. Now, once again, that sounds like this is a good way of doing it, right? Well, not quite. Let's bring in a little bit more. Luckily, not math, just statistics in terms of how it works. What you can see on the left is a scatter graph of these requests. So let's say you've got a whole bunch of um, people clicking and they like immediate retry, then two, four, six, and um, eight seconds. What you can see there is that because of that, the same back off between every single client out there, they're going to be clustered around those second points. So they'll be a little bit before or after, depending on when the user clicked, if it's a busy site, but you'll see these clusters. And what that does is that your database is just recovering and then Oof, slams it with 50,000 connections. You don't want that. So how you do and address that is by adding some jitter. And what jitter is, is by adding a random value. And I'll show you some code now. Because what happens there is it's that two seconds. And then what you do is you figure out the boundary to the next one, which is four seconds, and the previous one, which is zero seconds. And you say, take two seconds and add a random amount to it. So it will be spread out between that graph. And then what you get is a graph on the right, where you can see there, initially there's a lot of clustering because that period is short, but over time what happens is it's nicely spread out with different people retrying at different times. And we can do it with something as simple as this little bit of code that you can see over here. I'll leave it on for a moment. So that helps. Now we're talking about people hitting the retry, retry, retry button the whole time. So the next part that's important to understand to make resilient system is uh, to build your item potent operations. And what we do here is that think of your banking system. Let's say you were at an ATM and you deposited money, 50 Rand, and for some reason there was a timeout, so you deposit again and again and again. And when you come back to it, it said, well, I didn't, my balance didn't increase by 50, it increased by 200 or 1,000. That would be awesome for me as the end user, but it's probably not so awesome for the uh, bank, and you don't want that kind of behavior. 
So what I'm potent is that when you, for example, send a request to make a change, build your system in such a way that it knows that this change has already been submitted. For example, let's say when you submit a data update, you generate a UID on the web tier, immediately respond with update in progress, here's your ID. And then what happens is the client can say, cool, use that ID to pull back and say, listen, are we there yet? Or when it does a new update, say, listen, this is the previous ID I want to update. And there are different ways around this. But think about how to make your system able to handle this because retries will happen. People will double click on a button instead of single click, et cetera. And you don't have, like I said, the double balance increase type thing happening. So health checking. We all um, hopefully have heard of health checks where um, our load balancer checks is the instance or container or whatever it is we're running healthy. And can we send requests to it? So let's quickly take a look at architecture. So let's say, once again, typical system um, has got some auto scaling groups and they have got services behind them and they need to check, is the service healthy? Um, typically what happens is people build a health check that looks a little bit like this, which is, hey, instance, are you healthy? And the answer is either a yes or a no. Um, the fun part there is that while that instance is healthy, downstream services might not be. Because let's say that request comes in again, but the database is down this time. That means that that instance says, yeah, everything is happy, but everything is not happy because it can't service requests. What do you need to do? Well, start building, building some deeper health checks. And what these are is that the instance itself has the ability to assess whether or not downstream services are currently available or not. Um, and what happens is when one of them does become unavailable that prevents this specific service from operating, you then send push back upstream, creating back pressure, saying, I can't uh, service this request, sorry. Uh, I'm up, but I can't service request, which means that you don't keep creating this queue of um, services that wait. So this is great because it does help you with deep health checking to um, uh, make sure that your system is operating as it should. But when the system is under load, these deep health checks do put additional load on the system. So what you want to do there is that you don't throw away the shadow health checks. You still use them. For example, ping checks, because remember, Load balancers often use a ping check to say, is the instance up or not? So you need to be able to handle both because when you are under load, maybe disable that deep health check, just to be able to at least service some of the load and some of the query, uh, the quest while you figure out what's wrong and how to fix it. Because if you don't, that might contribute to actually taking the entire system down. So now that we're in the part where, you know, things are not going well, our system is under load, how do we actually make it go better? And this is where you start talking about shitting. And just quickly for our South African viewers, I'm not talking about um, our power outages that we have here in South Africa. Uh, what I'm talking about is that when we get a lot of requests on our application, where we can see that um, the latency on request, the more requests we get, the higher the latency becomes. And at some point, it's going to break. Now, the good news there is that's actually a very useful mechanism because we can set the client uh, time out on that. Um, so at the moment, you can see there, once it reaches, uh, it's about 145 milliseconds. We're going to start just timing out and rejecting it um, because that is a way to cheaply reject excess work. So let me visualize that a little bit better. If you look at this, is that below that line are the requests that are accepted and past that point, any additional requests that we can't handle, let's say requests per second or transactions per second, TPS, will be immediately rejected because of the timeout. So that's an easy way to actually protect your system from completely failing. Because once again, remember, slightly down or degraded is better than completely down. Being down for 90% of your customer, or sorry, being up for 90% of your customers and 10% down is much better than being down for 100% um, of your customers. But this metric is entirely dependent on what your system is. So this is latency. It might be something else. So what you need to do is be careful when selecting this metric, because it is different for everybody. It's not just, hey, latency works for every single person out there. So lessons learned here is that when you are looking at load shedding, um, rather start pessimistic and say, listen, let's set that time out to shorter, because then what you can do is you can always increase it and figure out where that sweet spot is for your users. Whereas if you set it too high, once again, cascading failures, your entire system might be down instead of just being for portion. So start pessimistic, increase it slowly. Um, and also, like I said, figure out what the metric is that makes the most sense for you. Is it number of database connections? Is it API latency? Um, it might be something else like literally number of people currently logged in, et cetera. Um, and also try and use uh, cached content. Uh, so make use of caching instead of uh, trying to hit static content inside your database. So let's say you've got a product catalog. Um, instead of going database select, get the catalog, which only changes one, a day, one time a day, figure out how you can cache this to be able to just hit that cache and go back because then you don't even touch the database, which means less load on the database. Um, and like I spoke about the ELB health checks, prioritizing those shallow ones when you are under load. Um, 
And then also when you are in an under overloaded situation, figure out how you can make the most out of it by, by shutting down anything you can that adds additional load to your system. For example, reporting. If it is adding load to your system, shut it down during that period because you need to get your customers back to using your system. So now we know a couple of ways to actually improve our system, but there's one more aspect which is a lot of fun and actually helps a, and a tremendous amount to actually increase resilience in systems. And that is by applying chaos engineering. Now, what is this? This is fire drills. Now, for those not familiar with the fire drill, this is where a company says, we're gonna test our, uh, what happens if a fire happens. Does everybody know where to run? Do they get out of the building quickly enough? Do they leave their laptops? Or do you have a person sitting there with noise canceling earphones going, la di da having a lot of fun and uh, supposedly the building is burning down. Um, a fire drill is a controlled experiment. It's not a, let's just drop production and see what happens thing. And there are a lot of tools are available out there. So you can look, for example, at Netflix's Simeon Army. Now, this is quite a fun tool because how they started off with is they initially built Chaos Monkey. Now, what Chaos Monkey is, is a service that will pick a random EC2 instance inside one um, uh, region and it actually just goes and says terminate. So if you don't have a mechanism to bring up a replacement, that's what it's testing. Then they've got one up from that, which is Chaos Gorilla, which says one availability zone, everything gone. Can I suffer, uh, um, actually survive an entire availability zone going? And then they took it a step further and they released Chaos Kong, um, which is an entire region. So three zones or more, delete every single thing inside there and say cheers. Now, obviously, you're not going to start with Chaos Kong. You're going to start small and start building uh, capabilities up. But this is how you start building that whole, can I switch from Europe to America in terms of the regions that I'm busy deploying in and running in? So what exactly is chaos engineering? Well, there's this definition, which is chaos engineering is the discipline of experimenting, very important, on a distributed system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in productions. So think about that along with that auto scaling group example we spoke about earlier. You should be able to test and delete one of the instances and see the auto scaling group bring it back up, load balance send traffic again to it. Um, once again, personal history, this is one of the best ways I explained um, and showed people the value in automating the infrastructure um, because this allowed them to uh, see that if something goes wrong, you know, we can just replace the instance. It's not a problem at all. So think about that. And then also you want to figure out how to do your failure injection. But once again, start small and build confidence. Um, these are some more tools that you can look at how to actually um, do that and make it better and also do different types of tests, not just the network is breaking. Do things like the CPU is slow, the memory is full, there's network latency. Don't just go network is off or on, but the network is slow, it's dropping packets, etc. cetera. Um, and how you go about doing that is you use this um, cycle where you start saying, listen, start off with a steady state. My system is up and running, it's healthy, it's happy. Then you start off by defining a hypothesis. If I remove an EC2 instance that is an auto-scaling group, uh, it'll replace it and the load balancer will be able to recover. Then run the experiment, delete. Then verify, did it come back up? Yes, we're good, so we know this works. Or, oh crap, it doesn't because our deployment doesn't work, something else went wrong. Think back to those um, AMI images that I showed you in the previous talk where there might be a new version, all of a sudden my app doesn't work with a new base package anymore. Then you go about fixing it, then there are ways to do it. And then you just keep looping the cycles. Every time you start seeing, okay, where's the part where we need to focus on? And in terms of what to focus on, I can guarantee you, speak to the developers and ask them, uh, what one system, if it breaks, we are screwed. They will point to one, I can guarantee you that, or to two or three. Start focusing and thinking how you can make those more resilient. And with that, thank you very much. Um, contact details are on the screen. If you do have any questions or follow-ups on this, um, please feel uh, free to reach out either on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Um, and also, like I said, those uh, details, and I'm sure the deck will be shared with you, um, Adrian Hornsby and Gunnar Grosh, definitely give them a follow if you are interested in chaos engineering. Thanks. All right, amazing talk and lots of considerations when you build up your systems. And I really love this classic questions about the backup because, I mean, quite frankly, uh, it's a Schrodinger's backup. It's there yeah. and it's not there. You don't know until you tested it and restored it. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. I mean, that that's really a, a very good ana analogy as well. Um, yeah, I mean, what what can people do in regards to um, improving the aspects of, of resiliency and, and scaling uh, their systems? I mean, um, 
do you think it's 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 already about the mindset and 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 taking this forward then within the company uh, in regards to the product development uh, has it an impact already during the development uh, of services in a company um, I'd say that there are two parts to that. The first part is creating awareness um, because often when you think about it, um, for example, the using uh, timeouts to prevent your system from overloading, um, not many people are have thought about it in detail, but take that and go speak to your the business side um, and explain to them, listen, we need to start thinking about how we want to make our systems more resilient for when, when they'll break. So we want to be doing experiments and we need to think about the different things that are important. When something breaks and we make a, have to make a hard trade-off between A and B, which one do you think, because it's an absolute trade-off, A or B, for example, force them to say which one of the two would they prefer to get, and make them aware of it. Um, and then you go for the easy fixes first, like the timeouts, the, the database backups, the um, using auto scaling groups to make sure your app stays up. And what you do is always involve the business side as well and show them saying, listen, today we're going to do a fire drill. We're going to, we, we, we did the following work. Come sit with us and watch. Look, we're testing. Look, we can lose a couple of instances. That site stays up. It's a bit slow, but it stays up. That's great because then they will buy into that because you need to buy in. It doesn't just help and say, listen, um, we're doing uh, we're doing things without them knowing. Mm. Yep, yep, indeed, indeed. Uh, I did, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I would, a really cool presentation. And my, I would just like to uh, ask you a simple question about how do we deal, like, if we're using Kubernetes to scale up and down and in relation to, like, a small project, uh, how does AWS and your services, well, simplify lives for system engineers? Okay. So first big bit of advice that you said Kubernetes along with small system in the same sentence. So my first bit of advice is don't use Kubernetes. Um, the reason is remember Kubernetes solves a specific problem. It's normally large distributed systems and it is very complex. So that, that's my first bit of advice. Um, secondly, in terms of the scaling, remember scaling is a, is, a, is a complex topic. It's not just about, for example, in Kubernetes, can I spin up more pods or not? It's do I have, have enough capacity? Do I have, have enough capacity on a single node to do it? Uh, scaling up tends to be add more capacity, spin up more services, fairly easy to handle with. But scaling down tends to be slightly more complex in terms of um, how do I move something off this host that is that I now want to scale down to and where do I put them and add adds load on the other side that could potentially break things. So that's a little bit more complex. Now, the last bit of the question is how specifically does AWS help you with this? Well, there's one service that actually helps quite a lot, which is AWS Fargate that allows you to run containers without um, the underlying host. So you say, please run this uh, container uh, with two gigs of RAM and one virtual CPU, and I want three copies of it. And now we've built that into EKS, which is our Elastic Kubernetes service. So you don't have to do the base capacity. You spin up, when you spin up your pods, you spin them up as Fargate um, instances, and that has got the, that specific compute. So there's no longer the consideration of, do I have enough capacity? Because you just say, spin up X, and it spins up. You spin it down, it only spins down that pod um, one at a time. So that goes down. So that's one way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And questions all from right. me, I think that's all. That's great. That's really great. And um, yeah, um, I also got a few ideas. Uh, I was actually uh, quite taken by the um, uh, introduction of um, jittering into the uh, handling for the database connections and, or the connections itself. Mm -hmm. So I definitely have to look into that because I mean, having this um, flexible uh, handling, um, you know, when you mentioned it, it was like, Hmm, this this reminds me a little bit about um, Anachron on Linux systems that you can actually have um, repeat, repetitive tasks, but with a flexible time frame so that you don't run the same or multiple processes always at the same time, but you give it some offsets so that, you know, you get this kind of random effect and uh, that it doesn't look too um, repetitive, even that it's the same task, but they're happening on, on different times. And I think mm -hmm. introducing Jitter into this connection handling is, is definitely a, a big uh, and to my opinion, also easy uh, modification to to improve the resilience on 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 this part of the application. Mm. No, definitely. I mean, one other thing I quick want to throw out before we uh, end the session is that goes look at the AWS or Amazon Builders library. 
Um, these are a set of artic articles by our principal and distinguished engineers about the things we learned along the way, like how do you do capacity management? How do you do with rolling deployments and roll them out? The lessons we've learned. So very, very awesome to go read about just how do you do things at scale? And it's not AWS specific, it's general software development things that we learned. All right. That's great, and I think that's a, that's a fantastic closing note. Um, Kabuz, again, thank you so much for your time, for your effort uh, uh, delivering this talk to us. Um, I'm really looking forward to hope you fully uh, welcome you in one of the future events that we have here in Mauritius. Um, and with that, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the day, maybe tuning in into a couple of other sessions, and um, have a great day. Thank you cool. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me. My pleasure. Cool. Bye.